Hmm. Ah, Lord. Let's see what somebody's doing on Instagram. Hmm, let's look at somebody's life and the highlight reel of their best moments. Ah. Ah, stuck. I just feel kind of broke down. Flummoxed, that's the word. Flummoxed. Or maybe baffled. Kind of bogged down, man. Better than broke down. Oh, oh, really? Should I hit the red button or the green button? (laughs) Ignore or have a conversation. Again. All right, here we go. Hey, bro, what's up? (sighs) Oh, man, yep. So you you feel the same. Yep, I got you, dude. I feel it. I feel you. The same place. The same condition. Just the same old, same old, the same issues. I, I know, it feels like the sidelines. We're sitting on the sidelines. Stuck, frustrated, the same condition, the same issues, the same rigmarole, just sitting on the sidelines. So, so let me ask a question. Are there some things you need to lay aside in order to walk in the destiny you were created for? Are there obstacles or baggage that's weighing you down, bro? I guess I'm preaching to myself. Is there something that stops you from getting in the flow of where you're supposed to go? Better put on a ball cap. You can see my bald spot. Is there anything worse? Is there anything worse? than being stuck on the sidelines. Watching life go by and you're broke down. Anybody ever been broke down? You ever had a flat tire on the side of the road? And nobody cares. (laughs) Have you been sidelined and stuck and just, just flummoxed? Baffled, frustrated, overwhelmed because everyone, yes, it's slightly moving, Greg, very slowly behind me. Yes. I saw you see it, yes. Because that's what it feels like. It's just moving and you're sitting still. And I'm, I'm here to communicate very clearly a real issue that some of you are dealing with. You see life moving. You see yourself not moving. But I'm here to tell you there is a divine interruption coming your way. It's on the way right now. There's there's a story. It's a unique one. It's in Mark. It's about a man, Mark 10, 46. And he's in the same place, same condition, same stuff, same coat, same place, same brokenness, year after year, he's stuck. He's on the sidelines and he's frustrated and he's lonely, but, but, but it's a great place to be stuck. I mean, after all, it's the Jericho Road. The Jericho Road is just a few miles from Jerusalem and, and he is positioned in the right spot, in the right place, even at the right time, almost. Mark 10 and 46 tells an amazing story about this guy. And it tells us that And I want you to put it on the board because I want you to see it that I'm not making this up. And as he went into Jericho and as he went out of Jericho. So, So look at how unique that is. Jesus heads into Jericho and the man is apparently unaware or perhaps he's not in position. But it's on the way out of Jericho that something significant happens. So, so if I could challenge someone in this house, you, you have to be aware 
that you don't always get the same opportunities. And you really have to have your hands in the air spiritually to perceive what's happening. Because when it's time to move and respond to God, you must do it. I'm not sure exactly because the Bible leaves it rather vague. And as they came to Jericho and went out of Jericho. Now, this is integral to this story. This is the last week chronologically of Jesus's life. Within seven days, he will be on a cross. This is the last physical healing other than Simon Peter's ear being reattached because he's a little aggressive. This is the last stranger that will receive a miracle because the cross is next. Jesus is on his way to his created destiny. He was made to be your substitutionary sacrifice. He was created that you would be free. And this is the culmination of all of the plan of God. The man Christ will die within seven days. So this is it. Either this man on the side of the road stuck responds to something he hears in a positive way or he misses the moment and remains blind the rest of his life. This is it. I think you could preach the sermon now. Look at your neighbor and say, don't miss your moment with God. (laughs) You don't have the luxury of knowing about tomorrow. You don't know what tomorrow will hold. So you, you, you have to make sure right now you're in tune with the presence of God. Because if you miss this moment, you might miss everything. Because if you're not attuned to the nuances of opportunity, you could miss this moment in the space of your life and deal with what you're dealing with permanently. But does anyone believe that God can interrupt the cycle today? That the parameters can shift today? If there's anything in you that's stopping you from getting in the flow of God's spirit, it's time to move past it. If it's offense or anger or frustration or loneliness or despair or discouragement, whatever the negative emotion is that's keeping you where you are, it's time to push past it. No more holding on to what holds you back. No more being comfortable with being dysfunctional. The question is, what are you willing to live with? I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to live with anything that God is not destined for me to carry. But too often we write it into our own story and say, well, this must be how life is. Someplace your faith has to fight for a breakthrough that'll transform your future and your tomorrow. Amen? Amen. Touch your neighbor and say, believe for the next level. And as they came to Jericho and went out of Jericho, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. The scripture is very, very specific there because he wants you to know this is not an allegory. This is not a parable. This is a real person. This man, the son of Timaeus, has sat by the highway side begging for a long time. And when he heard, and it's a key verse to the process of deliverance, and when he heard it was Jesus, he began to cry out. What you hear matters. Who you listen to matters. It is of the utmost importance that you surround yourself with the right kind of voices. Because you put the wrong voices in your life, you'll make the wrong choices in your life. You have to decide what you're going to listen to. Can I mess with you? You listen to country music enough and you will normalize divorce and drinking. Other women's and being dissatisfied. Women's, right? You'll normalize that. You can't even talk right when you listen to that stuff. (laughs) You listen to enough rap and you'll normalize filthy language. Sexual abuse. Using women's as objects of desire rather than someone to be respected and admired. Because what you put in determines what you give out. 
You watch the wrong kind of shows and you'll normalize behavior you never thought you would normalize. Hollywood and television are 10 years beyond, typically, the social acceptance in the United States of America. That's why the agenda is to combat and constantly bombard your mind so that 10 years from now, you will normalize what you wouldn't have thought about 10 years before. Boy, I feel the Spirit trying to tell someone right now, you are living below your ability to be free, and you got to make a decision no more. This man is, is dependent upon the benevolence of other people. His job is panhandling. He's placed there because it's a position of opportunity. Because it is only through the mercy and the kindness of other people. And opportunity is always built upon accessibility. Why do you think they waited a red light? Because you're accessible. Or when you've walked out of a restaurant and you're full and your tummy's full and then you feel guilty for not giving something to them. It's accessibility created by opportunity. So the opportunity is created by the accessibility for you. Bartimaeus has a system. He has a system, a routine that he has developed to live with. He has his spot. Say spot. He has his spot. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You got your spot. You got your chair, your place. Some of you have one emotionally and mentally. It's how you deal with whatever you're dealing with. You have your spot. You turn on the music, you get in the spot, you talk to the people, and you reinforce the opinion you've already decided to have. The blind man comes there every day. It's the mechanism by which you survive. It's the spot. Nobody would have known that he has a problem with who he is because after all, he's blind and he is surviving by knowing the familiar. The steps to the spot. How, how many steps does it take you to get to your spot? What kind of thinking puts you in that place that you are comfortable living with? D -d Don't move me to something different. You hear? Don't move me to something different because I'm comfortable where I am. No one would know, I'll say it again, that the blind man has an issue with where he is. Because that's his place. He doesn't really like it, apparently. But he's still walking through the process of being in the spot. It's, it's called the peril of routine. The danger of the status quo. The paradox of normal. The same routine over and over. I wrote this early this morning in prayer. The hazard of normalized assumptions. Well, I just assume it's never going to change. It's never going to be different. I'll never get married. I'll never have happiness, fulfillment. I'll never be successful. I'll never have a breakthrough. So I'll just stay here with the same cup, the same coat, the same place, the same thing. Committed to it even though you hate it. Walking through the rhythm and the ritual of it even though you despise it. David said, I would have fainted. I would have quit because I got sidelined. I would have walked away because I saw so many other people being blessed and I saw my life not being blessed. So he said, I would have fainted. I would have capitulated, walked away, given up and quit and thrown in the towel. But I believed he said it this way, unless I had believed. I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He said, even though all the data would say it's never going to change, he said, I believed that the goodness of the Lord will be mine right now. So, so, so I understood this isn't an a, eternal promise I'm going to put my faith in. I'm believing that somehow right now God's going to shift the reality of my circumstance, even though I am very frustrated by what I see happening in other people's lives, I would have fainted, but I believed. And, and, and I believe there's some people in this house who feel the very same way I'm preaching. You would have walked away and quit and capitulated under the onslaught of all the negativity and the chaos, but you believe this isn't all there is. That, that, that there's another level for you and God and a transitionary moment that shifts who you are to who you can become. That God's got greater plans for you than you believe the enemy has laid for you. So no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That 
But even though there's chaos and confusion, God has your best interest at heart. And you believe God is working for my good even now. When I'm overwhelmed, he stands beside me. I may be perplexed, but I'm not distressed. I may be cast down, but I am not abandoned. I may be lonely, but I am not forgotten. I I wish you'd believe that way right now, that something better is in front of you than where you are right now, because that's the core to changing your behavior to the negative routine. Listen, listen, don't become so weary in doing the right thing that you quit believing for the best thing. Because you can keep walking through the motions and it becomes such a routine that you rarely believe for something supernatural on the other side of what you've begun to believe is normal. The coping system, the things that you just can't escape because you've been waiting and waiting for God to do something supernatural. Do it. Push past the fear of finding out what's next. For those of you that work out, myself included, it's called muscle fatigue. Push to the limit you're carrying so much you faint. But David said it. Quote it with me. Psalms 27 and 13. Quote it without the screen. Say, I would have fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord. In the land of the living. I came close to fainting. I almost fainted. I would have divorced them. I would have sent my kids to live with their mama. I would have sent them off to be with their grandma. I would have fainted. I would have quit the job. I would have walked away from church. I would have gotten angry. But I believed. To see the goodness of the Lord. Because here comes faith reviving you when you're about to faint. Here comes God stepping in to give you hope. Because had I not believed to seek the good rather than live in the bad. Because listen, if you don't believe right, your life won't turn out right. Can I say it again? If you don't get your faith believing right, your life's not going to turn out right. That's why you got to push past. It said the voices that are fighting inside your head are fighting to control how you view your situation. Let's talk about Hebrews 12. You ready? Seeing we are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses. Some of you need to understand somebody's watching you right now. You are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. There is a significant audience that has their eye on you. So lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. Those things that cause us to stumble so you can't run. Perhaps I should differentiate weights and sins. Weights. Are not always sins. You hear me? But sins are always weights. Procrastination is not a sin. Any procrastinators in the house? Don't raise your hand. Wait for later. (laughs) Now you can, you know, raise it. (laughs) Avoiding your responsibility may not be a sin, but it is a weight. Procrastination is not a sin, but it is a weight. Not confronting issues because of your timidity may not be a sin, but it is a weight. And sometimes the weights cause as much of a slowdown spiritually as the sin does to trip us. And often we blame God for things that are not working when in fact it's just weights we won't lay aside. Not in sin, we just got a bunch of weight. And then we wonder why we can't run. Perhaps there's something you need to lay aside in order to be the champion you were created to be. So so, so did Jesus come and dwell with us for 33 and a half years and be beat with a cat of nine tails, stripped of his clothing, nailed to a cross, so you can be a church person that lives in sin? (laughs) 
You keep telling me, Pastor, I'm saved, I'm saved, and that's wonderful. But I wonder what you're saved from if you're gonna live like you used to live before you were saved. I just want the word to talk to somebody right now. I'm saved, Pastor, I'm saved. Well, what are we actually saved from? I'm saved from the man I used to be. So there should be a definitive change in the man I am now. Let's look at before and after photos. You know those makeovers they do to people? To make them look better? The edits on the web? Instagram? This is how Pastor looked before and how he looks now. He's on cybergenics at 53 years old. Show me your before and after spiritually. Between who you were before God and who you are after God. Is there a definitive shift or have you just added Jesus to the agenda of the life you continue to live? You should be able to look back over your life and see a significant altering of the person you were to the person you are now. And the people closest to you should see the most transformation. Stop running with people that all you have in common with them is your history and not your destiny. Some of you... You're connected to people and all they do is pull you back to who you used to be rather than propel you to who your destiny is meant to be. I'm telling you right now, I don't want to waste my time being connected to people that tie me to the sideline and I miss my moment. Bartimaeus in Mark 10 And when he heard it was Jesus, verse 47 of Mark 10, and when he heard it was Jesus, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He's sitting on the side of the road. He has his cup out. He's saying, alms, alms, alms. But a message comes to him. And that message is the one that's in Jericho now. You may have missed him on his way in, but the one you missed He's opening eyes that are blind and he's unstopping ears that can't hear and he's raising from the dead and faith started. I I would have fainted. I would have stayed here all my life but I believed to see the goodness of the Lord and there was a response of faith created by what he's hearing. That's why it's imperative that you have people in your life that speak faith into you in the critical times of your experience because if you don't and you don't have the right people speaking into your life, you'll make a judgment call in the moment when Jesus is passing by. And you can't, I heard it said this morning, you can't be led by your feelings. You got to be led by the fact of the word of God. And one of the issues with this generation is we're all too feely. Well, I feel, well, I feel, well, I feel. You won't be judged by what you feel. You will be judged by the word of God and how you responded to the word of God. Since when were you promised that your life would be happy? What guarantee did you get? Life is short and full of trouble, the writer said. I'm telling you, do you have people in your life that appeal to the worst in you and not the best? That when they're around you, they just pull you down into negativity and fear? You need to break up with that boy, you need to drop that girl. You need to move on. You say, Pastor, you're meddling. No, I'm trying to help you make sure you connect with Jesus Christ and don't miss a moment of visitation that's going to transform your world. Can I take it a little farther? And if you're one of those people that are emotional vampires, you need to change yourself in the altar. We got people that just suck the life right out of other people because they are so negative with their experience, they want everybody to share it. And they surround themselves by people who are positive, but then instead of being a positive influence on another positive person, all they do is pull from them with their negativity, their fear, and their anger, and their despair. You got a responsibility to pray yourself through to the power of God's spirit. You say, Pastor, you don't always say stuff like that. I just want somebody to have a breakthrough that transforms their life. So I'll say it again, stop running with people that all you have in common is who you used to be. 
Take a brief vacation with them. Talk about how wild you used to be and how you used to run, smoke, and chew and run with girls that do. But then when you're done with that little brief vacation, say, God, I am so thankful I am not who I used to be. Uh, Listen, you you gotta make a decision that you're gonna walk a path you have never walked before. So, So Bartimaeus is sitting on the side of the road and when Jesus passes by the second time, remember, he's on his way to Calvary. This is it. If he doesn't connect with him now, And when he heard it was Jesus, he began to cry out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And what happens? The kind of people he had in his life didn't want him to escape the routine. Shh, stop it. Hush, be quiet, simmer down, put a lid on it, stop. You're not worthy. You don't deserve it. But the scripture said so clearly that he felt a disruption in his spirit so significantly that he could not hold his peace. And that he began to cry the more, the Old Testament said, vehemently. The more they tried to silence him, the more passionate his praise became. And and I'm going to tell you it's praise because it's very important you understand that phrase. Hear me, but he cried the more a great deal. Jesus, thou son of David. Why is that important? Because the first thing he did was call him by name, Jesus. It's not praise if you don't have the right focus. You might as well be at a Bucks game. It's just noise. But when you make him the focus of your praise and your worship, Jesus. And then he says this, thou son of David. This is a term that's only used five times in relation to the Messiah. Five times. And what it says is, you're the Messiah, the promised one from the bloodline of King David. A blind beggar on the side of the road. Here's some information. That information is so life transforming to his thought process that he doesn't just look at him as a miracle worker. He sees him as the promised one that would redeem Israel from her sins and would save them from the tyranny of the Roman Empire. And he understands suddenly this isn't just a man with a miraculous touch. This is the one spoken of by Isaiah and the prophets of old. This is the one who gets his bloodline from King David. And so that's why he starts screaming revelation. And let me tell you something. When you start operating in revelation the world will try to shut you down. Jesus, thou son of David. Jesus, thou son of David. They're going, that's going to get you killed, boy. You better be quiet. You better simmer down. But he just can't simmer down because he knows this is my moment for transformation. This is my disruption. Everything is about to shift. I want someone to leave abnormal behind and move into a new supernatural level. Don't become loyal to something you're meant to leave behind. Stop being loyal to something you're meant to leave behind. Stop owning the despair and the anger and the depression and the fear and the frustration. Stop it. That's so significant in the scripture. Bartimaeus just keeps screaming, Jesus, thou son of David. Jesus, thou son of David. Jesus, thou son of David. The more they quiet him, the louder he gets. He's still in his posture. He hasn't moved. He's still sitting. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, thou son of David. The more they quiet him, the louder and more passionate his praise gets. It's motivated by belief and he is fueled by the negativity I wish someone would make up in their mind that that the criticism and the negativity and the hate would fuel you rather than silence you can I tell you listen to me real close I have never been more free hear me I've never been more free since I've discovered that the opinion of the people in the cheap seats don't matter You can say what you want to say about Pastor Tisdale. I'm just going to keep screaming for Jesus. You, you, you can say what you say. You, you, you can do whatever you want to do. But I, I'm just going to tell you, I, I'm just going to keep reaching for the power and the presence of Almighty God. If you don't break your routine, nothing's going to change. you got to push past the fear of rejection of other people. Nothing has transformed my life more than the understanding that my worth is not based on the judgments of those sitting on the sidelines. 
Did you hear me? So if you're not courageous enough to live sacrificially in God's purpose, I'm not even interested in your commentary. That got quiet. I'll say it again. Stop listening to the armchair quarterbacks who aren't in the game. Stop listening to the so-called professionals on CNN. Stop listening to the people that are telling you what to think and what to believe. Because you're being influenced by what you're hearing. And what you're hearing is limiting what you can become in God. What is God saying to you? What is God speaking into your spirit? Hear the right words that God's about to transform your life and take you to a level you could never live in. Stop trying to please the haters. Let me tell you something. There is no such thing as a jerk whisperer. Think about it. There is no such thing, Jared, as a jerk whisperer. Did you hear me? You're never going to whisper in their ear and get them to like you. You're never going to be talked the jerk into believing that God's got something good for you. Because there is no such, there might be a horse whisperer and a cat whisperer and a dog whisperer and a baby whisperer. EJ and Alexis need one. But hear me. There ain't no jerk whisperer. Because once a jerk, I didn't say that, y'all did. And four of the most powerful words in the New Testament, Jesus and Jesus stood still. It's a direct quote to the King James. His passionate praise that was not inhibited by what anyone thought by the opinions of others and their attitude. His passionate worship caused the God of all creation on his way to the agenda that he was born for. Caused Jesus Christ to stop. But listen, he didn't stop on the first scream. He didn't stop on the initial invitation and desire and passionate plea for Bart- from Bartimaeus. He didn't stop. And sometimes as Christians, we praise God and when nothing happens, we quit. Jesus, I need a miracle. And we don't get a miracle. And then we're like, okay, hey, y'all want to go to the bar? Because we, we really only have enough intensity to praise a little bit. And to fight through a little bit of obstacles. But he he didn't get Jesus' attention when it was a normalized, average, ordinary, status quo interaction. But when he was pressured by the crowd, maybe, perhaps, Jesus heard him the first time. But he wanted to see his reaction to the negativity and the influence of people around him. Perhaps Jesus was just waiting to see, is this real for you or am I a convenience factor? But when the negativity rose and the aggression increased, Jesus' response was to stop because he ain't got time for this. He's on the way to save you and me. He ain't got time for some guy on the side of the road. And if you study it, they had to wear a particular garment with a particular frag, a, a, a fringe on the bottom that designated where they were in life so you could pass them by and not talk to them because you could see them coming that they were less than you because there was a caste system. So understand, uh, you could avoid someone in that condition. But Jesus, Jesus stops for the person who others would say, you have nothing to offer or nothing to add. But Jesus stops. Stops because a man is opening himself in the revelation of belief that you are the one sent for me and I believe. I wonder what would happen right now if your praise became so passionate that you just took the lid off. Would you stop heaven in its tracks to give you a miracle? Someone, just let me say it this way. Open your mouth and holler. Open your mouth and scream. And then, why don't you do this? Why don't you, why don't you just do it? Why don't you open your mouth and just yell right now? Jesus. Now lean over and tell your neighbor, say, it's going to get loud. And if that bothered you, you're really going to be uncomfortable next. 
but because I, I, I'm so desperate for an interaction with his presence that I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get his attention focused on me. Maybe I should say it this way. Everybody wants to be great until we understand what greatness requires. Everybody wants to be a worshiper until we understand you gotta be a little nutty. You gotta take the limits off your pride and your arrogance and you just gotta say, hey, uh, God, whatever you gotta do with me, I surrender my life fully and completely to you. Lead. Lead from the sideline. Lead from the couch. He's broken, he's blind, he's hurting, he's overwhelmed. Jesus, have mercy on me. And the negativity rises and the, and the fear engulfs him. He's doing it right. But can I say something? You can't just do God right for a weekend and expect a miracle. This is an everyday kind of worship experience that you just invest yourself deeply into and you see what God's gonna do with you. I, I know you like to praise him on Sundays, but are you praising him on Tuesdays uh, in the middle of the week when things are sideways and frustrating uh, and the negativity's rising in your home uh, and your kids are getting mouthy and, and the frustration's building in your relationship? Can you find your praise in the middle of the chaos? There's nobody like you. Jesus I, I lift my hands and I worship you right now look I want to wrap up watch this Jesus can't afford to be late but the man's posture of faith is too much to resist Right now, someone in this house, you could put God in a place that he can't pass you by. It's impossible. He's got somewhere to be. He's got more important things. But hey, when you start praising him, it just simply stops the process of his advancement. And I love this because one word from Jesus changed the haters' dialogue. It's what happens. And they called the blind man saying unto him, rise, be of good comfort, he called thee. Look at that. Is this the same people the same people that are criticizing him. You hear me? Is this the same people that are criticizing him? And now they're telling him, hey, it's okay. Jesus wants you. Because that's what praise does. Praise gathers the attention of Jesus. And praise to him will transform you. And in the process of transformation, as people see the transformation in you and the attention God has on you, it changes their attitude. So, so, so I, want to, I want to illustrate something real fast. I wasn't going to preach this, but it's way too good not to tell you. C come here, Matt, really fast. Just stand right here. Come here, Tim, really quick. Come here, Jared. You sit right there in the middle by the pulpit, just super fast. Just stand right here. Stand right there. Okay. So this is super important. Okay, just sit down right there. All right, ready? Jesus is cruising. He's got his posse. We're on our way. He cries out, Jesus, have mercy on me, right? Thou son of David, say it. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus is close enough to hear him, but he doesn't speak directly to him. This is pivotal. Because he is a God of order and process. And he could have, and many of you want God to talk directly to you, but he doesn't. He speaks to the men and the women of God in your life to give you a word from himself. That's why you gotta hear the word of the Lord through the mouth of a man. That's why the enemy wants to publicize every mistake every preacher or saint of God ever makes. Because if he can devalue that God can speak, hey, I'm Jesus, Matt, I want you to tell Jared that it's gonna be okay. But if you can allow through injury and doubt and fear your trust in other people to be undermined, then you may miss a word from God that is designed to get you out of blindness and off the sidelines. Because if you can't hear the word of God in the mouth of a pastor or the mouth of a Christian or the mouth of another believer or the mouth of a Sunday school teacher, if you can't hear the word of God because you value your own opinion so highly and so anytime God gives you a word that runs counter to the words you're thinking and feeling and if you can't hear the word of God in the mouth of a man, you'll sit on the side of the road stuck and miss your miracle the rest of your life. 
Well, I feel the Holy Ghost trying to talk to somebody right now. That's why the enemy wants to erode the worship experience in the house of God. And he wants you to focus on, well, they're just all hypocrites. They're all just failures. They're all duplicious. Well, certainly we are. Where'd we come from? We came from the world where we're all hypocrites and we're all duplicious. We're just in the church trying to get saved and trying to be right. That's why you got to make a transition from what you were to what you're now becoming because we're in the process of being saved. You can get salvation in an altar today. You can repent of your sins. You can ask God to forgive you and be filled with his glorious spirit. But a mind transformation takes real years. And if you've been lying all your life, it takes a while to readjust to truth. And if you've been hypocritical and duplicious and cheating at your workplace, it's going to take some conviction and some lifestyle change to become what God's calling you to become. But listen to me. Don't you hold that over someone's head. Because if you do and you deny the voice of God in another believer speaking to you, you will miss your moment. Can I tell you something? There's a lot of preachers that are stupid. They're jerks. And there ain't no jerk whisperer to fix jerkness. They're just jerks. They're control freaks. And they're mean-spirited. And they think they're Lord over God's heritage, but they are not. But don't you dare let that real truth terrify you into not hearing the word of God through the mouth of a man. You hear me? He'll speak through someone that's carnal to give you a word. He'll speak through someone that's not praying to give you a word. Because God cares so much about setting you free. He cares so much about delivering you. Now, I'm going to be truthful with you. But you better be careful who you're listening to. So, if they're not living by the word of God, you better quit giving them their, your ear. You hear me? You better line up with the word of God spiritually so you can discern. when it's Because everything you hear when, they, when someone says it's God isn't always God. Everybody that's got a prophecy, it ain't a prophecy from God. It's a prophecy from Doritos at 11 o'clock at night. Every dream people are having, it ain't a dream from God. How you know it's a dream? If it lines up with the word of God and doesn't violate the principles of the word of God. That's why the scripture said you better study to show thyself approved. Because if you can't balance what somebody tells you with the word of God, then you'll be misled. You will never get a prophecy that runs counter to the word of God. It is not from God. You say, what do you mean, pastor? If somebody prophesies you, well, you should commit adultery. That ain't the word of God. Somebody prophesies, well, you ought to stay home from church. That ain't the word of God. Somebody prophesies, you should never give. That ain't the word of God. Somebody prophesies, you shouldn't forgive. That ain't the word of God. So that's how you know. But God chose. Jesus himself said, I'm going to give that man a word. And even though I am close enough to hear what that man says, I am not going to speak directly to him. Because he's got to choose. You ready? These voices. Come here, Greg. Or this voice. The voice that's telling him to hush and be quiet and not be boisterous and aggressive. And these voices. Every one of you has this choice to make. Are you going to hear the voice of criticism and hatred and negativity? Or are you going to hear the voice of faith that says the best is coming your way? Who are you going to identify with right now? Are you going to hear the voice of the critic and the hater and the negative and the fearful? Or are you going to hear the voice of a man who comes up and says, or a woman, and says, God told me to tell you, rise. Be a good cheer. He's about to do something in your life. Who are you going to believe? Because listen, in your analytical nature and in your criticism, if you align yourself, yourself with the wrong voice it'll keep you stuck in your history and you will never rejoice in your destiny so you guys can sit down it's just me and this guy right here you're not you and this is it and I'm done I wasn't even gonna preach this long watch this rise be of good comfort he called thee and he you know what the next word says Casting away his garment. I saw you look for the screen. (laughs) And he, casting away his garment. Why is that significant? Because this is the identification of who he used to be. He's not even healed yet. He's not even free yet. 
He's not even delivered. He's still blind. But he goes, I ain't going to need that no more. Whew. Yep, he just called me. My praise connected to his presence. And something, I, I can't see a lick. But, but I'm throwing off who I used to be because I'm about to become something new. I wish someone in this house, you would just take the old and lay it down right now. Take the anger, the frustration, the doubt, the fear. Get it off. This is so cool to me. He gets up there and he says, and he cast him with his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And then Jesus says, what would you have me to do for you? He goes, you don't look blind. You're not bound by who you used to be. And listen, listen, put it on the board because I want you to look here, look. And Jesus answered and said to him, what, would you, what do you want me to do? I guess he could have asked for a big house and a Ferrari and a Learjet. Look. And he said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. I just threw off the identity of my failure and I want to be free. Now watch this, watch the next verse. Go that way. Jesus never even lays hands on him. He never even anoints him with oil. He doesn't speak some kind of formula. He just says, you can go. You're healed. Go thy way. The faith that caused you to push past the cynicism and the criticism, the faith that cast off the garment that designated who you used to be, that faith in action has already made you whole. You're done. And immediately the sight came. Oh, there is an immediate interruption for someone in this house right now. If you would just move off the sidelines, if you would just move off the back pew and onto the front pew, if you just move off the side and into the center, if you would just move uh, somehow beyond where you are right now, if you would just move into the presence of God. Come on, somebody give him praise in this house. Somebody start telling him, you are my answer. You are my solution. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus, there's no other name under heaven whereby I can be saved. Jesus, your name is higher than any other name. Jesus, you are who I need every day. And I praise you right now. Come on, that's it. Somebody get a little crazy in your praise. Yeah, go ahead and hush. That's good. That was a good first praise. That's good. We're good. Mm. Musicians come. I don't know if that's what works. I think if you're desperate, you just go crazy. If you really need a breakthrough today, you just push past an average response. Because if you don't get it today, you may not get it at all. But there is a praise that will call, pause the purpose of God and put the focus on you. Give God the kind of praise that demands attention, that demands a breakthrough, that demands stop him by the intensity of your worship. When, when the Lord said to Solomon, what do you want me to give you? Ask anything and I'll give it to you. You know what it was in response to? A sacrifice of 1,000 rams. 1,000 rams when one ram would have been enough. But Solomon said, I am going to excessively worship you. And that excessive commitment of worship released a blessing that could not be contained. And the Lord said, because you didn't ask for yourself, but you ask wisdom to rule, rule my people, I will give you wisdom, I will lead you, but I will bless you, and I will release goodness and favor and finances because you were worshiping me extravagantly. It opened up extravagant blessing. So I'm gonna ask you to do it again. Music's gonna come. I don't know what they're gonna sing. But here's what I want you to do. If you believe you can get off the sidelines, if you believe that there's something for you beyond where you are right now, if you believe, like Jacob, I'm not letting go till he blesses me. If you believe that there's a breakthrough on the other side of your worship, a healing, a deliverance, if I was you, I'd just, I, I would just worship him with an intensity today that is outside my normal routine. Why don't you inform the enemy and why don't you stop God with your praise? Because God's not gonna stop unless you get passionate. He's not gonna stop unless you get intense. 
He's not gonna interrupt your life unless you really, really press. If you need the Holy Spirit, why don't you praise him right now? If you need the goodness of God, why don't you praise him right now? If your marriage needs help, why don't you praise him? If your money needs to be liberated, why don't you praise him? If depression and anger need to go, why don't you praise him? If you need a healing in your body, why don't you praise him? Come on, you know how to do it. You know how to do it. Every guest, every member, we're just going to get the Lord's attention with our worship right now. Hallelujah. Come on, that's it, that's it, that's it. You want to see your family make a turn? Praise him, mama, praise him, daddy, praise him, son or daughter. You want to feel the will of God work out in your life? Praise Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, that's it. That's it. That's it. Somebody, somebody get loose in the spirit right now. That's it, that's it. Come on, get a miracle. Get a miracle. Praise till it happens. Praise till you talk in tongues. Praise till you feel a renewal in your spirit. Praise till you feel a breakthrough. Hallelujah. Dancing out of my grave clothes. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. Morning tear. If you've never received the spirit, you need to hurry to the front right now. Savior God up in.
close. We're going to sing it again. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take somebody. You're going to be that voice that speaks to someone and says, rise. He, the Lord's calling you. You're going to say, it's time to get up out of the grave. So I want you to put your hand on someone's shoulder or take them by the hand or lay your hand on their head or put your hand on their back. It don't matter. But here's what you're going to say. You ready? I want you to look at them and say, Jesus has something better for you than where you are right now. Now say it like you believe it. Say, Jesus has something better for you than where you are. Oh, I feel that. Than where you are right now. One more time. Convince them. Say, Jesus has something better for you than where you are right now. In the name of Jesus, I decree it to be so. Hallelujah. Get up, get up, get up. Everybody say, get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Hey, get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Sing it right there. Come on, get off the sidelines. Get up.
as he keep me up, turn me around, place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior. He healed my heart, changed my name, forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior. I thank God. Oh, I thank God. I thank you, Jesus. to you Jesus we're so grateful to you Lord we thank you as a song that says thanks thanks I give you thanks for all you did God 